said with us, we surrender everything to you. Praise you, Father God, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Let us worship you, man. Thank you. 
you win in the end. All things. It's all for you. So we just thank you, Lord, that we can be counted worthy to escape things that are coming across this world. And oh my name, Jesus Christ, and yes, we just praise you, Father God. We thank you for releasing even now healing virtue for all those that need to be healed or whatsoever. Because there is no such thing as an incurable disease. All things are possible with you. And I Hallelujah. So we're going into this holiday weekend. And um, some years ago I was invited to play classical guitar um, at some posh event in, here in the city and, uh, for the 4th of July celebration. And my daughter accompanied me to this event. She was still in the teens. And this politician came up to me, a well-known one, I guess, in this state. And he asked me something very strange. He said, just like just like I've done playing you walks up the stage, he goes, Do they celebrate the 4th of July in England? <laughs> I looked at my daughter, she looked at me and gone, He's serious. I, was, I said, Yeah, except we call it Benedict Arnold Day. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, by the way, Gen uh, Benedict Arnold is a general of the Re American Revolution, for those that don't know, um, especially baby boomers probably don't know about it. Um, he, he, he was what they would call a turncoat, right? Back then, the, the, the army here wore blue coats, and the British, they still wear red coats, right? So he traded his blue coat for a red coat, and went back to the, the British side, and, Basically, he died in disgrace. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with him in the end. He went back to England because they would have you know, done terrible things to him here. And he died in disgrace. Nobody wants to be around a traitor. So let us learn from others' mistakes and misdeeds so we live a life that's glorifying to Christ. Amen? Amen. You know, actually, um, King George is the, he's one of England's, was England's longest running monarch before Queen Victoria, you know. Of its theatre title. And he was actually very well loved for a time. He, he um, went against the, the French Napoleon you know, um, invasion and, and was successful. But then he lost America. And then he went mad and he had fits of um, severe depression. And ultimately, you know, he had a big um, bout of um, insanity which led Parliament back then to enact the Regency to his son, so his son took over. Um, sadly, there was nobody close enough to the king in that day that had a, had a Bible. I mean, they, they had the King James Bible at that point, right? Nobody had the Bible to, to go to him and, and deal with the, the evil spirits that were behind the insanity. I find that rather strange. But um, sadly, no one was there that cast all demons out of this man. It says in Psalm 103, just to bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, including insanity, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, and crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies thine mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed not in evil. We're going to take communion in, in a moment. Um, because it's a really important thing to do. Um, I just want to pray that blessings overtake you and chase you down in the almighty name of Jesus Christ and the Israel. Amen. So the Lord provided healing in salvation. It's part of salvation, right? And um, as well as provision and everything else. So um, we, we find in 1 Corinthians uh, 11, Rome 29, 13, it says, um, Anybody who eats or drinks the Lord's Supper without recognizing the body the Lord eats and drinks judgment to himself. That's why many of you can see it in the time. So week after week, you know, there's churches right now, people coming up to eat communion in the wrong spirit. They've got some resentment, they've got bitterness against them. Don't take communion then. Get yourself right with the Lord, right? Um, 1 Peter 2.24, by his wounds you've been healed, they participate in the communion service, right? And maybe they don't believe God heals today. Um, there's all kinds of issues that would cause an issue with people here. So 1 Corinthians 11, right, gives us very important instructions about this. And I think the major thing here we see 
is Christ's crucifixion was a prophetic fulfillment of the ancient Passover um, where the Pharaoh was a type of shadow of Satan who, who held people in bondage. And the Lord provided a way to escape. Right, what? They, they, they put the blood on the, um, the doorway of the home, right? And they did some blood here, and it's here, so, and it's over here, and then one of the top of the, the door. So basically they made the sign of the cross. And we reason in um, Acts 2.24, they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such should be saved. So communion, as we, we proceed in obedience now with the Lord, let's confess and sin from our hearts. And if you're at home, you can do the same thing, right? Just prepare some elements and do this with us. Um, if you're not ready um, for whatever reason, no one's going to judge you, take your peace and uh, do it at another time. It's too dangerous to take communion if your heart's not right with God. So I just ask that nobody be allowed to take communion if they have a quarrel with anyone and that needs to be settled for us. Go and resolve your issues and then come to the Lord's table, right? So we pray, Father God in heaven, we are so grateful that you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and Israel, Messiah, and Yeshua, to come to earth, redeem us from all our sins, all the gener generational iniquities. And we're so grateful, Father God, that you give us this privilege of partnering with you like this. We ask that you forgive us now of, of all and any sins that we participated in, even this day as we woke up and, and we had thoughts that we shouldn't have engaged in. I ask you, Father God, search our hearts. Search our hearts, Father God, and, and reveal anything that needs to be revealed, anything that's hindering us in any way that we can get right with you now. So we choose, Father God, to forgive all those that have wronged us, all those that have offended us, including ourselves. We ask that you lay not a charge against them. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, Father God. We choose to receive your forgiveness now so we can forgive all others and ourselves on both sides of our generations, all the way back to Adam. We thank you, Father God, that you bring strength and health and physically, spiritually, emotionally to everyone here, everyone listening online, watching online. Because of the new covenant that was firmly sealed through the sufferings of you, Lord Jesus, on that cross, we just thank you, Father God, that you can remove all spirits of infirmity, all spirits of torment of every kind, that you have complete control and dominion over all of it. And so we ask you that we be translated out of the kingdom of darkness into your glorious light. In the Almighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Can we pass on the others, please? Um, we want to go before the Lord and understand that His body represents that we, we, we confess um, that the bread represents His body as we confess the sins before Him and give thanks to heaven. Thanks to Father God for all this. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, God. Of course, the, the, the fruit of the vine um, this represents his, his blood as well, his new covenant. Let's take the bread right now and give you thanks for the God. For life and for knowledge that you've made known to us through Jesus Christ, that we, we come together as your church in one accord with you now in, in our communion and holiness. And, and we can partake of this for the God. From the ends of the earth, the, the your kingdom, we look forward to the return of Jesus Christ in the earth. And we just thank you, Father God, that um, you got the 
cross off everything on the controller that we just surrendered to you right now already in Jesus. So let's partake of the bread. And there's healing in the atonement, there's healing as we take communion. We take the fruit of the vine and we thank you, Father God, for your shed blood, your precious holy shed blood for each one of us. And we take this in obedience to you now. In the mighty name of Jesus. where I left off last week. I'm going to go a wee bit deeper today. I'm going to continue where we left off about giving spirits of doubt and unbelief. So if we have a title of this message, I suppose it be um, dealing with spirits of doubt and unbelief. Now, we talked about the, the, the um, the story of the healing of the young boy who sounded like he suffered from epilepsy. Um, find this passage in, in Matthew 17. And then I'll start in verse 14. And, and when they were come to the multitudes, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's a lunatic. And so vexed, and often time he falls into the fire, and often into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless, perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples of heart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say to you, if you have faith, the grain of a mustard seed, which is a really tiny, you know, like a pinhead. If you have the faith of a, the grain of a mustard seed, you shall say unto the stone, remove hence to yonder place, it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. I'll be this coin goes up, not but by prayer and fasting. We're called to live a fasted life. Okay. It, it's good to fast from food as well, but actually when you fast three days, it really resets the entire metabolism. But um, we're called to live a fasted life, a holy life, right? With peace, seek peace with all men and, and, and all people and holiness, with, for without no one's going to see God. And it appears to me most scholars agree this incident happened in Matthew 17, um, just after the Transfiguration, which was a time of its horizon. So let's understand the Lord gave us signs to help us understand how glorious He is. So in, in general relativity, an event horizon is a boundary, is a space and time. Basically it's the same thing. Um, and so beyond events, you know, they, they can't, uh, for the outside observer, they're not going to be able to do this, right? So an event horizon here is commonly associated with now black holes. Black like holes in space, right? That this is what CERN is up to. So light emitted um, inside of an event horizon can never reach the outside observer, supposedly, but in God it's supernatural, right? So in other words, the Lord Jesus Yeshua transcended space, he transcended time, and in more than just all dimension, he's in several dimensions at this time, and it was observable by the disciples. Now if you recall the Lord Jesus took three disciples with him, took Peter, John, and, uh, and James with him. And they'd gone up and had this extraordinary experience on, on the mountaintop, the transfiguration, and they're coming down the mountain to re you know, rejoin the rest of the organization. Sounds like the other disciples were all gathered there with a crowd of people waiting. So they come down, and, and, and I'm guessing from reading uh, this over the years, and studying People swarmed around Jesus as they would do. They, 
and, and this one man cries out, requesting in the strongest terms possible, please heal my son. And, and he explains, you know, how the, the boy would fall into the fire and he'd fall into the water. So I think we've got a number of clues here and details that give us a more depth understanding that, that describes the illness of this young boy than in some of the other Gospels. Mark stated that he was foaming in the mouth. He was grinding his teeth. His body would get rigid and he'd not be able to speak. Now I've been on horses, they get a stiff neck. They, they get like, you know, frightened about something and they get their, their neck stiff and it's all the adrenaline run through it and it's very, very difficult to, to deal with a horse that's got a stiff neck. Because you maybe you want to, you know, get away from whatever's going on and, and you're trying to turn them and you go, no, no, I'm really scared. And, and it's like a spirit, a fear overtakes them. And it's rather um, a dangerous situation to get into with horses, by the way. And I sometimes wonder if it's the same spirit because, see, but an, an evil spirit, a disembodied um, evil being, and it can't express its evil nature unless it's got an animal or a person to manifest in. And we've all seen people manifesting things over the years, right? Well, for instance, you can see somebody with anger in their eyes. A Christian with anger in their eyes. Where is that coming from? That's not from the Lord. It gives the righteous anger, right? That the, that just to get angry about things is not, not of God yet. Now Mark 9, 17, and one of the multitudes answered and said, Master, I brought him unto thy son, which has a, de a, a dumb spirit, and wherefore he's taken to the terrace him in his foam, and he gnashes with his teeth, and pines the way, and I spoke to the disciples, and they should cast him out, and they could not. So we read, read here in Luke how, how the man mentions his son crying out, he's got convulsions, He's bruising himself, he's foaming at the mouth, he's a mess. In Luke um, 9.39, and though the Spirit taketh him, see, they already figured it out. Most of the people in today's society they haven't figured out these are spirits. And though the Spirit taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out, and terreth him, and foameth again, and bruising him, I hardly departeth from him. So many scholars would agree the symptoms sound like a form of epilepsy. Modern terms. However, consider this a deaf and dumb spirit behind things like epilepsy um, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to give somebody a suicidal tendency, right? Because he, he's, trying to, he's trying to kill him. There's the, the spirit that wants to kill him. Well, that's what the devil does, right? He comes to kill, kill, and destroy. So it needs to be dealt with just like any other unclean spirit. It comes um, it could come through an illness, it could come through some injury, some trauma, it's an open door for the enemy to come in with diseases, and research has shown how injuries can open the door to a spirit of um, epilepsy to manifest. Grand mal seizures, for example, can result from an injury. This is in the scientific medical journals. So, however a spirit enters into your holy temple, I'm not as concerned how it gets in as I'm concerned about getting it out. Amen? Okay, so we've got to ask God, you know, to heal. And, and, and it's got, we have to understand some level of ministry because we're all called to be ambassadors of Christ. So clearly, you've seen from Scripture here this boy's illness was a spiritual um, issue, as most illnesses are. I mean, okay, Gavin Science was saying, you know, maybe you know, 95, 97% of all sickness and diseases begin in your thought life. Not every thought you have is your own. And that means that 97% of all sicknesses and diseases can do what? They can be healed by putting on the mind of Christ and doing what God says, meeting His requirements. Amen? So, um, here we've got, in, in Martin, we've got a difficult situation. Some, are, some people here, some of you listening and watching, might be facing a difficult situation right now, or well, some time in the future. But let us understand the profound insights of those. Um, revealing to us today from the Word. So the father of this troubled, suffering boy obviously heard, he heard of wonderful things about Jesus, Yeshua, Rabbi Yeshua, is healing people, his disciples are healing people. He must have heard of these miracles and so he's, I, I gotta get to Jesus, right? It's like the lady with issue of Somehow I gotta find this Rabbi Yeshua, I'm gonna go, and he's gonna heal my boy. And, um, so, 
Jesus was, you know, up on the mountain when he gets there, and they go, ah, oh, he's up on the mountain, you know, he can't, he can't, can't see him right now, I can't talk to him right now. Um, so what would he do? The natural thing is, well, can you do it? Those are the disciples there. You, you belong, you're working with them, you're part of the ministry, you do it. Now we read in um, Jesus' day, this miraculous ability, authority, the, the, the heal the sick and cast out demons in his almighty name, right? And we read in Matthew 10, verse 1. And when he called unto his twelve disciples, he gave them power. What's everybody looking for today in the world? Power. That's why they get stuck in, in Harry Potter land, right? They're looking for power. Right. That's why Christians made the, the witch that wrote the Harry Potter series so wealthy, because they're, they're so many churches and now like a GMO. They're genetically modified organisms. They don't come from the Word of God, they come from some kind of motivational psycho babble, whatever. Don't, don't get me started on that. <laughs> but so here, uh, Matthew 10, 1, and when he called unto him the twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Does that leave anything out? No. There's no such thing as an incurable disease. With the Lord, all things are possible. Now think about it. Later on, he sent out the seventy. And we don't even know who those were. They were, they were people he discipled, and, and he sent all the 72 by 2, and then he sent us out in every preceding generation to do the works of God. Amen? Amen. So, however, um, in this particular case, the disciples could not cast out the unclean spirit. Now, already, they've done this before, they've ministered the way the Lord told them to do. But this time nothing seemed to be happening in any dimension until the Lord Jesus shows up and heals the boy. Now if we study this passage carefully, we see it, it, it mentioned three times how the disciples were unable to get the job done. And states in, um, in verse 16, they could not cure him. The disciples asked, why could we not cast, him, cast it out of him? And Jesus said, because of your own belief. Right, I, I brought him onto the disciples, they could not cure him. Then came the disciples to Jesus, but why could we not cure him? Cast him out of Jesus because of your own belief. No. Being unable means you're not operating in power. You don't, you're not connecting to the, the dunamis power, right? Because he says in verse 20, if you have faith, nothing shall be impossible unto you. Will nothing include what? That, 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 that everything's included, right? It's all inclusive. We want to be inclusive. Here it is. So dunamis is where we get that word dynamite, which is, was, that, you know, that was established the most powerful explosive of its day, dynamite. So everywhere we look, people are wanting power. Now, if you come in today, and the electricity's working, and all we have to do is turn on the light, the power is there. You plug something in and then you get power. How much more should we just connect with the Lord? Connect with His divine supernatural power. And instead of focusing on, on all this supernatural power though, I find the scripture here is putting the spotlight on the disciples' failure to get the job done. Even though they had power and they had authority to do this. Now the actual emphasis is indicating the disciples' inability to heal the boy um, probably due to their, you know, they were somehow they were entertaining the spirit of doubt and unbelief. And I find it particularly interesting to sort this out that the tone of Jesus' words, now he sounds rather put off when you read this. Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? Does that sound like the Lord's a wee bit frustrated here? I mean, can anybody relate to this? They're ever feeling that way? Why can't he just do it right? Why can't he just get the job done? I told you how to do it. I showed you how to do it. Just do it. Does that sound like he's saying that? Do you think you can get the Lord upset? Can we grieve the Holy Spirit? It says we can. The Lord actually rebuked the crowd gathered there. He comes down off this amazing experience and he rebukes the, the, the crowd. He calls them faithless and perverse generation. So what sort of perversions? We're going on back there compared to the ones that people are doing, doing today. I think we can link this perverse generation here with the people probably were all well acquainted with the Old Testament. 
And so it's directed as the Israelites and in places like Moses and then um, dealt with this in Deuteronomy 32. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 5, it says, They have corrupted themselves. The spot is not the spot of his children. They are perverse and a crooked generation. So Moses said to his people, You're perverse, you're unbelieving generation. They saw the supernatural miracles of God working in the midst, and what happened? They still didn't believe. Just like today, with so many churches today, they don't believe the gifts of, of healing of, for today. A lot of them think that they've been taught in seminaries that they go teach that the gifts passed away because somebody tried to heal somebody and didn't work, so they went, oh, we'll make up something. Let's make up a theology and all the a new doctrine, why it doesn't work anymore. So that, you know, all this buying into this end time deception. So Papa God was deeply disappointed with the church of Moses' day. How does he feel about the church today? Are we impacting the world for Christ or is the world impacting the church for the devil? In Deuteronomy 32, 4 says, He's the rock, His work is perfect. For all His ways are a judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right as He. They, they have corrupted themselves, their response is not to the spot of His children, they have perverse and crooked generation. Notice the word here, the words, a God of truth, without iniquity, just and, and right, which is what? The exact opposite of faithless and perverse. In Deuteronomy 32, the verse we've done 20 here, it says, um, And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for there are very four generation children in whom is no faith. Talk about perverse and crooked generation. Talk about my generation. This is it. It's right here. Children with whom have no faith. So how has God's children become so faithless and perverse generation? See, in Matthew 17, 17, then Jesus answered said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him here. Bring him to me. The Lord Jesus rebuked the Jewish people as a whole, and he included his disciples that they were among the faithless. Christ answers his disciple is, is very revealing, I think. They asked, why couldn't we cast them out? They come in privacy. We have to have a high level of meat. Why, why couldn't we do that? I mean, you know, we did it before, it's not working. Why, why couldn't we do that? They tell them, because you lack of faith, lack of belief. In other words, you lack of faith when you should be building on the supernatural memories and experiences that I've already shown you. Now, obviously, the disciples, they had some faith. They had a measure, we've all been given a measure of faith, they had a measure of faith. They probably even thought, you know, they'd be able to, to do this because they've done it before. So, okay, yeah, bring them to me, you know, we pray right now, in the name of Jesus and His authority, okay, cast out the evil spirit, something goes wrong this time. What are you going to do when it doesn't work? You can make up a new doctrine. Are you going to dig in deeper? Now we read, Christ saying, O faithless and first generation, how long shall I be with you? Doesn't this indicate that Lord expected his disciples to be able to get the job done? That's what it means. He should be able to do this. So what would be the point of rebuking your disciples if you're not expecting them to be able to handle the situation in the first place? Could it simply be that Jesus already taught them how to appropriate the power? He granted them power, supernatural power, and he, and he commanded them to do this. You think it's possible the Lord would get upset and, and frustrated? When he knows that you should know better. When he knows that you, you know, you're backsliding, and you should be backsliding. When he says in Hebrews 6, 6, if they shall fall away, and renew them again unto repentance, seeing that they crucify themselves in the Son of God afresh, and put them to an open shame. Well, Pastor, let's just talk about grace. Don't be wrong. Right now. <laughs> I'm going to stay on this. Um, that's, that's the problem. You know, people think they can get away with stuff. The, the Lord clearly says, I don't want you doing that. Right? Stay in faith. Now, I believe the Lord Jesus 
with, with seeing those disciples, but we're still not connecting the spiritual dots here. He realized, you know, he, he was soon to be offered up on that Roman cross for the sins of this entire world, and his disciples, his, his guys still were not where they should be. They, they weren't in, in a place in the supernatural experience. They had all these amazing miracles. They've been with them. They've seen amazing, extraordinary things happen. And yet they still didn't have that level of belief that they should have had. And the Lord said, how long shall I be with you? Isn't he in fact saying, why are you still depending on me? Why, why are you defend, you know, depending on me to do these things which I instructed you to do in my name? You're supposed to go and break the power of demons, cast them out, and heal the sick in my name. I gave you permission. I gave you authority. What's going to happen when I'm not here physically now? Isn't he saying something to the effect of, come on, chefs, you really need to get some, some clue here. Get, get, get the power that they've given you. Get connected. You know, Ephesians 6, 12 tells us, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, not just the low places, like maybe high government places as well. We look at the corruption in the world stage today. Understand the fact that if you're a follower of Christ, it doesn't automatically mean you're quick to engage in spiritual power. You need a baptism of the Holy Spirit to happen here. Now, we, we, we learn to appropriate the power that had been granted by the law as the original disciples learned. So when Jesus, you know, the disciples weren't able to heal the boy, it was because they didn't really believe. The failure of the disciples to heal this boy was due to the failure to appropriate the power in faith. It says in Matthew 17, 20, Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say to you, if you have faith, the grain of mustard seed shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to the altar place, and shall be removed. Nothing shall be impossible to you. You know, I, I, uh, there's a place in Turkey where somebody actually did move a mountain in faith. Back, um, uh, we talked about the evidence before. I think we've written articles about it. Historically documented. So it's, it's very possible, right? And Simon the Tanner, you can look it up. In faith, he moved the, the mountain to stop the um, Islamic guys from um, destroying the, the Christian town. They made a challenge, you know, move this mountain, and he moved it. God moved it for him. They have a church there where the mountain used to be. So faith in Christ here means that, in Luke, you know, 9.23, and he said unto them, this is where it comes down to, this is faith, right? Luke 9.23, and he said unto them, and, to, and he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So this is a basic requirement. You want to get power from the Holy Ghost to flow through you? This is the requirement. In other words, the pathway of true supernatural power is the pathway of the cross of Christ. We read in, in, in Matthew 16, 21, and from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again on the third day. So I'm assuming from reading of the thing from God as a God, this is probably one of those moments where the disciples said to themselves after he explained, okay, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, they're going to do terrible things, they're going to torture me, they're going to kill me, but don't worry about it, not to worry, I'm going to rise up on the third day, everything's going to be just amazing. But, um, and, but they probably had that moment listening to seeing all the miracles that happened and went, I don't believe that. It was shocking to them, it's like, it's like hearing a, a TV reality host saying, I'm going to be the next king of the world. Or I'm going to be president of America, right? Kind of the same. How many people didn't believe that one? I rest my case. <laughs> See, they, they had a moment of unbelief. I don't believe. I know what you're capable of. Why would you let them do that to you, right? And then Peter even gets in there. You know, no, I'll never let this happen. He goes, get behind me, Satan. You now you're listening to the wrong kingdom again. So in other words, 
Matthew 7 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Why are we a remnant church? Few there be that find it. And I, I've never been one to preach a popular message. Is my job to, to grow a, a popular church? My job is to grow mature Christians. So, so they can go out and disciple more people into the faith and make more mature Christians. So we can get the job done, right? So in other words, the Lord's showing us that if anyone's going to totally submit to Christ, they've got to be prepared to suffer, they've got to be prepared to lose everything in the process, including their life. Matthew 16, 25 says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. What did the Lord, what did the Lord mean here? There's some people that will not taste death before they see the Son of Man come in his kingdom. It's in Matthew 16, 28. I don't want to take this long. Matthew 16, 28. Verily I say to you, that some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The next major event that Jesus had after this promise of the statement was the transfiguration. Now I looked up the Greek words here, translated kingdom, also is translated royal splendor. In other words, meaning the three disciples standing there, Peter, James, and John, that Jesus took to the mountaintop with them, would see Christ as he really is the kingdom of heaven, the king of heaven, which would be the transfiguration, which was the time of event horizon, Christ's crown set to dimensions. So Peter, James, and John saw Jesus meeting with Moses and Elijah, as you recall, and, and was representing the law and, and the prophets of the Old Testament. And they had a high-level briefing session here. They were part of it. The disciples saw Jesus in all his glory, all his splendor, talking with the glorified bodies of Moses and Elijah. How did they know that was Moses and Elijah? So they got a glimpse of what was going to occur. occur in the, um, in the kingdom of come. The, <coughs> not the disciples were simply shocked when, when this transpired. And, and they, remember, they fell on their faces. Let me read this to you. In Matthew 17, in verse 4, then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Can you just see this? Oh, it's really good for us to be here experiencing this. If thou wilt, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he yet spake, behold, a, a, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. What an experience they had. They, they got to see him to heaven. Now, in, in the transfiguration of our Heavenly Father, is glorified as only begotten Son. I don't think Jesus displayed his glory for the sake of just simply impressing the three disciples, right? Hey guys, come here, I'm going to show you something really brilliant. This is going to blow your minds, right? He didn't do that. It's not like him. It's not his nature. We read in, in John 8, 50, and Jesus said, And I seek not my own glory. There's no one that seeketh and judges. He didn't seek his own glory. Jesus said, I cannot seek my own glory. I, I, I would conclude then, as the Father God, Father God who, who transfigured Jesus, bringing his glory to come upon Jesus in such a way that he's transfigured here. After all, you think about it. What, what, what people does the Lord glorify? Who gets glorified? Without exception, it is me, it was people that are not seeking their own glory. I mean, look at throughout history, all the people that, have, that God's raised up, you know, like, like a plumber, like Smith Wigglesworth. Really? I'm, I'm going to take a plumber, um, I'm going to take a smelly old fisherman. <laughs> people that weren't seeking glory. He was, he was not like, oh, you know, I just really want to get on uh, Britain's Gold Talent, you know, and 
Are we going to see how wonderful I am now? This is not that so. So he seeks people that are not seeking their own glory. Without exception. And, uh, the ones that are prepared to deny themselves, to take up their cross and follow up to Christ. So before the transfiguration, we see that Jesus was praying. And as he prayed, what happened? The appearance of his face was altered and, and, and his robe became white and glistening. Luke 9, 29 says, and, and as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, his raiment was white and glistening. So there's a connection here between being glorified by God and, and Jesus willingly doing the Father's will and approaching. He knows we have gone to the cross. I, I'm going to suffer for the whole world. We can't even get our minds around what he had to go through. And in Luke 9, 30, it says, Behold, he, he talked with the two men, with Moses and Elisha, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, his death. They, they came and spoke to him about his death, which he which would accomplish in Jerusalem. Okay, you know, it's, it's that time you're going to go to the cross now, and, you know, you, whatever high level the conference they had. So Moses and Elijah come appearing in glory, speaking with Jesus about what he's going to accomplish in Jerusalem on the Roman cross in order to sacrifice himself for the sins of this whole fallen world. So in the context of this, we understand the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, he's clothed with God's glory and in the transfiguration, God comes with, um, the glory comes only with God's supernatural power. You can't separate them, can you? Right? We've got some glory here, we've got some power there. They're, they're t together, they're combined, right? How can you have that kind of radiance and glory without that luminous power from God? See, a true spiritual believer in Christ is going to display some power. It's going to manifest the glory of God. Like when, over the years, I mean, I've prayed for somebody, I've been mean, traveling and I'm, it really seems to me, so when I'm going somewhere else, I'm traveling, I'm seeing more miraculous stuff happen a lot, because they're not looking at me. People don't know me. They go, ask some guy, you know, some bridge just showed up, he's talking about Jesus, he's representing Jesus. They're, they come forward because they want to connect with Jesus, not me. And then God does supernatural healing miracles. You know, I've seen people heal from accidents. It's in my, my, my first book, um, my, my friend Dr. Terry, had been trampled by a horse. And I went and I prayed for her, and, and God healed her right in front of witnesses. The pain went through her body. She got up and said, do you, do you want to go and be out the hospital for us? I said, no, he just told me I got a vision, come pray for you, that's all I'm supposed to do right now. Just hear from the God, do what he says. So this is going to happen without humility, right? You know, I gotta tell you, it, 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 growing up in, in, the, in the entertainment world and, and, and being a you know, recording artist, um, people try to, the whole industry is built on trying to make it bigger than life. And I had to walk away from all that. It was very humbling. It was. I was like, I, I don't want that anymore. It, it's not taking me where I want. I, I remember back in the day when I was hanging out with major rock stars and celebrities at the time. And, I got this feeling they all thought they're going to buy the way into heaven. They're going to, the show was going to take them and the, the limousine, the gates were going to open. Oh, we're so glad you're here. We've been waiting for you, right? It's not going to work that way. So the, the, the longer you live for yourself, you, you know, we need to live a life that's glorifying to Christ. Amen? Jesus went to suffer on the cross. Not to save himself, but that he can save us. So we're going to continue the work here, in the same work that he's called us to do. See, with all this plain of Christ's love, we're just a bunch of noisy, clanging symbols according to Scripture. I mean, think about it. You know, we got you know, tele, um, tele evangelist, you know, and a lot of it's clanging symbols. Look at me. You know, send us your money and, 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 and we're going to, you know, have God do something for you. It's like the cell of indulgences with the Catholic Church. Same spirit. Could break away from that stuff. Humble yourself before God so He can use you. I mean, use that donkey when I was 22. I think we should qualify more than a donkey then. 
go do the works of God, right? And we have the mind of Christ and let's use it. If the Holy Spirit resides in our hearts, <clears throat> we have the faith to move mountains, then we should be able to use these various gifts. When we come together as a body of Christ, all the gifts should be operational. But we all have different gifts and, and we should just understand and use them for the glory of God. All of you are connected with the power of the dune and power of God. Just be willing to be used however He uses you. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, And God has set some in church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, <coughs> then the gifts of healing and helps, government, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Well, the answer is rhetorically blind. No, that's not true. We're not all of these things. We're not all apostles and prophets, but some are. <coughs> have all the gifts of healing, to all speak with tongues and do all its of it. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet shall I unto you a more excellent way. Let's get into the, the more excellent way part here. <coughs> we, we learn um, the, the gifts of the power of the function, like in verse um, Corinthians 13, we, we read that and then we, we do wedding ceremonies, right? It's all about love. Without love, nothing is going to work. If faith isn't going to work, nothing is going to work. So you've got to have the love and the faith <coughs> putting together, it's like peanut butter and jelly, right? It's made to, to work together. So we, we put others before ourselves. And that's, that's not a natural thing. <coughs> not a lot of people want to do that. I have to drink something. <laughs> Excuse me. It's early, okay. So, without the love, without faith, it's just not going to work. And, and we've got to humble ourselves and, and put others first. So you can't walk around <coughs> resenting other people, <coughs> holding bitterness, holding unforgiveness, whatever. You know, God loves all His creatures, great and small, and so should we. So, we want to exercise, you know, lifting up others up so they can be edified. But let us pray. Father God, all things are possible with you. We enter into the Holy of Holies, enter in with you, that you save us and deliver us from <clears throat> all kinds of issues in our life, family issues, business issues, relationship issues. We can pray about anything and everything and see miracles and healings in our life. And you tell us you're no respect of persons. And the power is very real and available to all of us. So we just thank you, Father God, for releasing that power now. Not in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> Let us just say this together. Say, Father God. Father God. I'm here today. I'm here today. Because I'm seeking to know you better. And I thank you now for forgiving me of everything that I thought wrong, especially in all your provision, about connecting with your faith and your copy love for all the wrong things that I did that are not pleasing to you. Those things that you call sin. All those generational sins and iniquities that I was born into. That I could come down and break those ungodly things from continuing in my life this day. So that I'm able to now cancel the assignment of the enemy in my life. So I speak 
out loud, so both the visible kingdoms hear me now, and proclaim that I believe Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Messiah Yeshua, died on that cross for my sins, that he's become my Lord and my Savior by his precious holy blood, by his atonement, that he's washed away all my sins this day and cleansed me by his holy blood, by his atonement, and that he lives forever and has provided the only way to come and live with him for all eternity. So that even now, as I'm here as a child of God, I can leave and go and move in the supernatural. I go forward in faith, in trust, a godly love, that I lift others up and edify them. I godly love them because of your love for me, Lord. And that nothing will be impossible. Because all things are possible with you. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for filling me with your Holy Spirit and the gifts of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, including speaking in other languages, languages I've never learned, that, that edify you, that the devil doesn't understand, but angels do, the good angels. And I pray for others that they be blessed and they be healed and that miracles happen and all the sick recover. I thank you, Father God, for always providing for me according to your riches in Christ Jesus. That you know my needs even before I, I pray. I thank you, Father God. Thank you for doing this now. Wash me clean from all unrighteousness. I confess these sins to you. That I walk forward now in your power, your supernatural power, to do what you call me to do as an ambassador of Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We just thank you, Papa God, as uh, one of your represents. I pray again that all sickness, all disease be eradicated, that your church rises up worldwide to do what you call us to do in this, these last hours. We pray again for the peace of Jerusalem. We, we, we pray for godly leadership in this world. We thank you, Father God, for exposing corruption at every level, expose the devil's deceptions, his, his lies. Uh, all the things that he's trying to bring into this world to confuse people. We break the power of that in the Almighty name of Jesus. We come corporately to break down the, the attacks of the enemy in this world, in this nation. And we just thank you, Father God, that your people will understand and they will humble themselves and they will pray and they will confess their sins, especially as this nation celebrates um, this 4th of July celebration for victory that they are victorious in Christ. And we thank you, Father God, that we can pray always and be constantly worthy to escape the things that are coming. You said that let those days be shortened, that there will be no flesh saved. We thank you, Father God, that people would wake up to the, the um, deceptions, especially in the transhumanist movement, the things that are going on with um, <coughs> the, the fake news and the, and the media pushing the idea of um, extraterrestrial Savior is coming. Father God, expose this stuff. These are demons. They're interdimensional demons. We thank you, Father God, for exposing this at every level. And that we can go forward with joy in our hearts. Every day we have here that we number our days and, 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 and realize that this is a day that you have made that we can rejoice and be glad always. Amen. Hallelujah. See you next week. Thank <laughs> you.